Agatha Christie. Halloween party. Chapter 1. Mrs. Ariadne Oliver had gone with the friend with whom she was staying, Judith Butler, to help with the preparations for a children's party which was to take place that same evening. At the moment it was a scene of chaotic activity. Energetic women came in and out of doors moving chairs, small tables, flower vases, and carrying large quantities of yellow pumpkins which they disposed strategically in selected spots. It was to be a Halloween party for invited guests of an age group between 10 and 17 years old. Mrs. Oliver, removing herself from the main group, leant against a vacant background of wall and held up a large yellow pumpkin, looking at it critically, the last time I saw one of these, she said, sweeping back her gray hair from her prominent forehead, was in the United States last year, hundreds of them. All over the house. I've never seen so many pumpkins. As a matter of fact, she added thoughtfully, I've never really known the difference between a pumpkin and a vegetable marrow. What's this one? Sorry, dear, said Mrs. Butler, as she fell over her friend's feet. Mrs. Oliver pressed herself closer against the wall. My fault, she said. I'm standing about and getting in the way. But it was rather remarkable, seeing so many pumpkins or vegetable marrows, whatever they are. They were everywhere, in the shops, and in people's houses, with candles or nightlights inside them or strung up. Very interesting, really. But it wasn't for a Halloween party, it was Thanksgiving. Now I've always associated pumpkins with Halloween and that's the end of October. Thanksgiving comes much later, doesn't it? Isn't it November, about the third week in November? Anyway, here, Halloween is definitely the 31st of October, isn't it? First Halloween and then, what comes next? All Souls Day? That's when in Paris you go to cemeteries and put flowers on graves. Not a sad sort of feast. I mean, all the children go too, and enjoy themselves. You go to flower markets first and buy lots and lots of lovely flowers. Flowers never look so lovely as they do in Paris in the market there. A lot of busy women were falling over Mrs. Oliver occasionally, but they were not listening to her. They were all too busy with what they were doing. They consisted for the most part of mothers, one or two competent spinsters. There were useful teenagers, boys of 16 and 17 climbing up ladders or standing on chairs to put decorations, pumpkins or vegetable marrows or brightly colored witch balls at a suitable elevation. Girls from 11 to 15 hung about in groups and giggled. And after All Souls Day and cemeteries, went on Mrs. Oliver, lowering her bulk on to the arm of a settee, you have All Saints Day. I think I'm right? Nobody responded to this question. Mrs. Drake, a handsome middle-aged woman who was giving the party, made a pronouncement. I'm not calling this a Halloween party, although of course it is one really. I'm calling it the 11 plus party. It's that sort of age group. Mostly people who are leaving the Elms and going on to other schools. But that's not very accurate, Rowena, is it? said Miss Whitaker, resetting her pants nez on her nose disapprovingly. Miss Whitaker, as a local school teacher, was always firm on accuracy. Because we've abolished the 11 plus some time ago. Mrs. Oliver rose from the settee apologetically. I haven't been making myself useful. I've just been sitting here saying silly things about pumpkins and vegetable marrows, and resting my feet, she thought, with a slight pang of conscience, but without sufficient feeling of guilt to say it aloud. Now what can I do next? She asked, and added, what lovely apples. Someone had just brought a large bowl of apples into the room. Mrs. Oliver was partial to apples. Lovely red ones, she added. They're not really very good, said Rowena Drake, 
but they look nice and partified. That's for bobbing for apples. They're rather soft apples, so people will be able to get their teeth into them better. Take them into the library, will you, Beatrice? Bobbing for apples always makes a mess with the water slopping over. But that doesn't matter with the library carpet, it's so old. Oh, thank you, Joyce. Joyce, a sturdy 13 year old, seized the bowl of apples. Two rolled off it and stopped, as though arrested by a witch's wand, at Mrs. Oliver's feet. You like apples, don't you? said Joyce. I read you did, or perhaps I heard it on the telly. You're the one who writes murder stories, aren't you? Yes, said Mrs. Oliver. We ought to have made you do something connected with murders. Have a murder at the party tonight and make people solve it. No, thank you, said Mrs. Oliver. Never again. What do you mean, never again? Well, I did once, and it didn't turn out much of a success, said Mrs. Oliver. But you've written lots of books, said Joyce, you make a lot of money out of them, don't you? In a way, said Mrs. Oliver, her thoughts flying to the inland revenue. And you've got a detective who's a fin. Mrs. Oliver admitted the fact. A small stolid boy not yet, Mrs. Oliver would have thought, arrived at the seniority of the eleven plus, said sternly, why a fin? I've often wondered, said Mrs. Oliver truthfully. Mrs. Hargreaves, the organist's wife, came into the room breathing heavily and bearing a large green plastic pail. What about this, she said, for the apple bobbing? Kind of gay, I thought. Miss Lee, the doctor's dispenser, said, galvanized buckets better. Won't tip over so easily. Where are you going to have it? Mrs. Drake. I thought the bobbing for apples had better be in the library. The carpet's old there and a lot of water always gets spilt, anyway. All right. We'll take them along. Rowena, here's another basket of apples. Let me help, said Mrs. Oliver. She picked up the two apples at her feet. Almost without noticing what she was doing, she sank her teeth into one of them and began to crunch it. Mrs. Drake abstracted the second apple from her firmly and restored it to the basket. A buzz of conversation broke out. Yes, but where are we going to have the snapdragon? You ought to have the snapdragon in the library, it's much the darkest room. No, we're going to have that in the dining room. We'll have to put something on the table first. There's a green baize to put on that and then the rubber sheet over it. What about the looking glasses? Shall we really see our husbands in them? Surreptitiously removing her shoes and still quietly champing at her apple, Mrs. Oliver lowered herself once more onto the settee and surveyed the room full of people critically. She was thinking in her authoress's mind. Now, if I was going to make a book about all these people, how should I do it? They're nice people, I should think, on the whole, but who knows? In a way, she felt, it was rather fascinating not to know anything about them. They all lived in Woodley Common, some of them had faint tags attached to them in her memory because of what Judith had told her. Miss Johnson, something to do with the church, not the vicar's sister. Oh no. It was the organist's sister, of course. Rowena Drake, who seemed to run things in Woodley Common. The puffing woman who had brought in the pail, a particularly hideous plastic pail. But then Mrs. Oliver had never been fond of plastic things. And then the children, the teenage girls and boys. So far they were really only names to Mrs. Oliver. There was a Nan and a Beatrice and a Kathy a Diana and a Joyce, who was boastful and asked questions. I don't like Joyce much, thought Mrs. Oliver. A girl called Anne, who looked tall and superior, 
there were two adolescent boys who appeared to have just got used to trying out different hairstyles, with rather unfortunate results. A smallish boy entered in some condition of shyness. Mummy sent these mirrors to see if they do, he said in a slightly breathless voice. Mrs. Drake took them from him. Thank you so much, Eddie, she said. They're just ordinary looking hand mirrors, said the girl called Anne. Shall we really see our future husband's faces in them? Some of you may and some may not, said Judith Butler. Did you ever see your husband's face when you went to a party? I mean this kind of a party. Of course she didn't, said Joyce. She might have, said the superior Beatrice. ESP they call it. Extra sensory perception, she added in the tone of one pleased with being thoroughly conversant with the terms of the times. I read one of your books, said Anne to Mrs. Oliver. The Dying Goldfish. It was quite good, she said kindly. I didn't like that one, said Joyce. There wasn't enough blood in it. I like murders to have lots of blood. A bit messy, said Mrs. Oliver, don't you think? But exciting, said Joyce. Not necessarily, said Mrs. Oliver. I saw a murder once, said Joyce. Don't be silly, Joyce, said Miss Whitaker, the school teacher. I did, said Joyce. Did you really? asked Kathy gazing at Joyce with wide eyes, really and truly see a murder. Of course she didn't, said Mrs. Drake. Don't say silly things, Joyce. I did see a murder, said Joyce. I did. I did. I did. A seventeen-year-old boy poised on a ladder looked down interestedly. What kind of a murder? he asked. I don't believe it, said Beatrice. Of course not, said Kathy's mother. She's just making it up. I'm not. I saw it. Why didn't you go to the police about it? Asked Kathy. Because I didn't know it was a murder when I saw it. It wasn't really till a long time afterwards, I mean, that I began to know that it was a murder. Something that somebody said only about a month or two ago suddenly made me think. Of course, that was a murder I saw. You see, said Anne, she's making it all up. It's nonsense. When did it happen? asked Beatrice. Years ago, said Joyce. I was quite young at the time, she added. Who murdered who? said Beatrice. I shan't tell any of you, said Joyce. You're all so horrid about it. Miss Lee came in with another kind of bucket. Conversation shifted to a comparison of buckets or plastic pails as most suitable for the sport of bobbing for apples. The majority of the helpers repaired to the library for an appraisal on the spot. Some of the younger members, it may be said, were anxious to demonstrate by a rehearsal of the difficulties and their own accomplishment in the sport. Hair got wet, water got spilt, towels were sent for to mop it up. In the end it was decided that a galvanized bucket was preferable to the more meretricious charms of a plastic pail which overturned rather too easily. Mrs. Oliver, setting down a bowl of apples which she had carried in to replenish the store required for tomorrow, once more helped herself to one. I read in the paper that you were fond of eating apples, the accusing voice of Anne or Susan, she was not quite sure which, spoke to her. It's my besetting sin, said Mrs. Oliver. It would be more fun if it was melons, objected one of the boys. They're so juicy. Think of the mess it would make, he said, surveying the carpet with pleasurable anticipation. Mrs. Oliver, feeling a little guilty at the public arraignment of greediness, left the room in search of a particular apartment, the geography of which is usually fairly easily identified. She went up the staircase and, turning the corner on the half-landing, 
cannoned into a pair, a girl and a boy, clasped in each other's arms and leaning against the door which Mrs. Oliver felt fairly certain was the door to the room to which she herself was anxious to gain access. The couple paid no attention to her. T. Hay sighed and they snuggled. Mrs. Oliver wondered how old they were. The boy was fifteen, perhaps, the girl little more than twelve, although the development of her chest seemed certainly on the mature side. Apple Trees was a house of fair size. It had, she thought, several agreeable nooks and corners. How selfish people are, thought Mrs. Oliver. No consideration for others. That well-known tag from the past came into her mind. It had been said to her in succession by a nursemaid, a nanny, a governess, her grandmother, two great-aunts, her mother and a few others. Excuse me, said Mrs. Oliver in a loud, clear voice. Teehee boy and the girl clung closer than ever, their lips fastened on each other's. Excuse me, said Mrs. Oliver again, do you mind letting me pass? I want to get in at this door. Unwillingly the couple fell apart. They looked at her in an aggrieved fashion. Mrs. Oliver went in, banged the door and shot the bolt. It was not a very close-fitting door. The faint sound of words came to her from outside. Isn't that like people? One voice said in a somewhat uncertain tenor. They might see we didn't want to be disturbed. People are so selfish, piped a girl's voice. They never think of anyone but themselves. No consideration for others, said the boy's voice.